series. Today we are having Daniel Perea present on nanoscale tomographic mapping of hydrated materials with cryo-AAPT. Uh, all participants are automatically muted upon login. Please be sure your volume is up and that your screen is in full view. Um, this is a one-hour presentation with no scheduled breaks. However, at the end of the presentation, if there are questions, uh, Daniel, will, Daniel will review and answer those as best he can in the time we have allotted. Um, if at the beginning when you registered, you submitted a questions, he is prepared to answer those questions, uh, either during the presentation or following the presentation. Um, and that'll be the last 10 to 15 minutes of the presentation. Danny, if you wouldn't mind going to the next one. All right, we do have some upcoming programs uh, with all the virtual options going on uh, during the situation. We do have some online events. We have a webinar coming up in June on recent advances, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy and near ambient pressure methods. That'll be uh, presented by Katerina Artishkova. Uh, that is June 10th. We also have some online short course training coming up next week. One course is on atomic layer etching with Steve George on May 19th. Another is sputter deposition with Angus Rocket on May 21st. Uh, registration is live for all three of these events. So if you go to the AVS short course schedule page, you will find these three events. We also have the AVS 67 national short course program coming up in uh, Denver in October. Um, that schedule is to be determined uh, hopefully this summer and uh, pending all things go uh, with travel, we should hopefully see people in Denver. Next. And we also have two Career Center webinars coming up. Um, one is May 28th, also this month. It's a busy month. Um, this one will be on how to virtual network and find collaborators from afar. That presenter will be Elena G. Levine. Registration is open for that as well. And then we have one more Career Center webinar uh, going over modern resumes and CVs. Our presenter will be Lisa Balbus. That is later this year in September. However, registration is open for that as well. Um, let's see. We also have some technical meetings coming up. Our ALD ALE meeting has gone from on site in Ghent, Belgium. We have now transitioned to a virtual meeting. So if you are interested in this, we will be going live soon with that. Uh, we also have the gallium oxide um, conference coming up in Washington, DC in September. Our AVS 67 International Symposium and Exhibition is also scheduled uh, for October this year in Denver, Colorado. And following that, we have the uh, PAC Surf 2020 conference taking place in December in Hawaii. And from there, I'd like to introduce our presenter today, Daniel Perea, goes by Danny. He is a senior staff scientist at the Environmental Molecular Sciences Laboratory National User Facility at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. He received his PhD in material science and engineering from Northwestern University, where he established the application of APT to quantitatively map 3D dopant impurity distributions in low dimensional semiconductor nanostructures. His current interests at PNNL include developing unique cryogenic based techniques and protocols to pioneer the use of APT to probe the composition and structure of environmentally sensitive materials related to energy and the environment. Um, and from here, Danny, I'd like to turn it over to you and let you get started. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, thank, thank you for the opportunity this morning, here my time, to talk with everybody and I appreciate everybody logging in. Um, I'm talking to you from my home uh, as many of you, I imagine, are, as we're still ourselves under social distancing orders here, um, just as everybody else. Okay, so yeah, let's see. Make sure this works. Okay, so just a quick outline. Um, I'm going to talk today about, give you a quick introduction, really about who am I, uh, where am I at, uh, what is atom probe tomography, um, how do we actually prepare the specimens, 
um, and as well as the challenges and opportunities there are with those. Um, just like an EM, um, it's the sample prep is about 80 to 90 percent of, of, of the analysis, uh, the quality determines quality analysis. Then I'm going to describe uh, really it's a journey towards developing uh, the application of APT to hydrated materials, specifically motivated by biological materials. And I'll talk about stepping through this journey, uh, working first at room temperature with resin embedded specimens, just to say, just to show that we can say something uh, uh, important about biological systems, and then designing, going to designing uh, and fabrication of, of specialized uh, hardware and developing the protocols that would allow us to do specimen prepara preparation under cryogenic conditions. And then ultimately leading to the application of APT um, to biological materials. And I'll end with that with, with showing that our latest results with looking at uh, proteins that are embedded in water ice. Okay, and just shown here is just an animation of some of the APT data that I'll get into in a moment here. Um, again, uh, I won't go, go, go too much into this. Um, uh, Heather was nice enough to give a, an introduction there. But yes, I'm a staff scientist at Environmental Molecular Science Laboratory. Um, it's a user, national user facility on the PNNL campus in Washington State. Um, we're located in, in southeastern Washington there, about three and a half hour drive from Seattle. Um, people can come work with us, the scientists, and use our equipment through a, a, a competitive proposal process. Uh, we do have yearly um, calls for proposals, which usually come out in the spring. Um, so if you're interested more about finding out those opportunities, please go to this website, uh, emsl.kml.gov. Okay, so atom probe tomography. So what is this technique? I assume that not everyone here on the call is, is intimately familiar with it, but it's a technique that utilizes the, the physical phenomena of uh, thermally assisted field evaporation to remove atoms uh, or small clusters of atoms from the surface of a material one by one. Um, and then we're able to detect them through time of flight and a position sensitive detector then from which we can then reconstruct that material uh, in three dimensions, and that's what's shown here. So this is some of the data that you can get from, from this technique. Um, this is not a simulation. Each little dot there happens to be a single atom of germanium or phosphorus in this example. Um, we have near atomic scale spatial resolution. Um, if you have crystalline materials, you can even start to resolve the atomic planes in any given direction there. Um, we have about, at best, about 10 part per million sensitivity to every single element, but not only element, every single isotope of those elements in the periodic table. So we can detect and map those. And laterally, uh, field of view laterally, you get, it's, it's on the order of maybe 50 to 150, maybe 200 nanometers laterally, and vertically, hundreds of nanometers, and in best cases, about a micron, uh, more over a micron in length. So it gives you a sense of your field of view. And we collect anywhere from a few million to hundreds of millions, and even some cases approaching couple, over a billion ions that you're trying to detect and reconstruct. Um, I think it's instructive to go over how the technique works to gain appreciation of, 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 the, of how this uh, technique works. So you can explain the technique by three basic structures. You have your specimen substrate array, you have what's called a local electrode, and you have a position sensitive detector. Now the local electrode is just a truncated cone, um, which is, has a hollow aperture opening of about 150 uh, micron. And, and the spacing between that and your specimen is about 100 or so microns. So drawn here on the, on the right is, is just a, a schematic cartoon of the potential energy uh, landscape at the surface as a function of distance from that surface. So this is under no applied field. So each of the atoms are kind of happy and bound and bound to the surface there. Okay. But once we apply an electric field, we apply a bias between the local electrode and the specimen, that creates an electric field at the at the surface here. And field strengths on the order of tens of volts per nanometer, which are pretty large, very immense electric fields, enough to, to change the potential energy landscape as so. And we can recreate a what's called a shocky barrier or a shocky hump here. Um, where we can liberate, we can create an ion, a positively charged ion from a bound surface atom in this field by giving it some thermal energy. And okay, we do that by giving it a pulse of a laser 
right? And that gives it enough thermal energy to come over this bump, pump. We ionize it. This ion is in the electric field, so it experiences work and is accelerated in this field, in the field region, and then drifts in the field-free region to the position-sensitive detector. Simultaneously, with the, with the application of each pulse, we start a clock, right? And we measure the delta T or the time of flight, how long it takes an ion to go from the surface to be detected at the position sensitive detector. And by relating the kinetic energy and the potential energy, you can back out the mass to charge ratio. And so ultimately we get the, the mass identity of that ion. And we do this over and over, right? And in addition, each one of those detected ions, we also know the lateral position, the relative position of where it came from. And we can determine Z from this mass sequence. So we have X, Y, Z, and mass identity of each of the detected ions. Then we can reconstruct that volume in three dimensions. And this is the kind of data that you get. Okay, you get a mass spectra. So you get elemental information resolvable to each isotope. So shown here is silicon and alumina in a zeolite type material. We can see all three isotopes of the silicon in different charge states. Um, and the positions of the atoms we can map out in 3D and you can produce these three-dimensional movies. Very unique, right? Where each dot in space is a position of a single atom or small clusters of atoms that we detect. Um, because we have this information in tomographically in 3D, we can actually measure the composition uh, profiles along any arbitrary direction we choose. So you can determine distributions of atoms uh, uh, throughout uh, and, and look at and start to quantify heterogeneity like say clustering, right? And you can do cluster analysis and things like that. You can study grain boundary chemistry, uh, nucleation growth of secondary phases, uh, impurity distributions, and start to at least semi-quantitatively determine what those relative distributions are and composition, compositions are. Um, so this is a, the data that you get, and it's really rich um, with information there, right? And this is very great technique for material science and engineering. But what we're interested in, in, in applying is this into new materials like biology and, and whatnot. But before we get into that, I think it's also very important to understand how the specimens are made, the fabrication of them. And about 90, 95% of the time, we end up using with, uh, an FIB, SCM, scanning an electron microscope to do a, a, a site-specific lift out of a region of interest. So we can go in and cut out a volume of material from, um, from the cert starting from the surface of a material. We then attach it, so we can lift it out and attach it to these pre, uh, prefabricated microposts and shown on the right here, on the left here, or is an array of those microposts. We then attach a small portion of that uh, volume to there. And if we turn this image here 90 degrees, we can see this lamellar wedge material that we cut out. And we have welding material that on the sides, and I'll explain a little bit more of this as we go along. Um, and then we, from the top, we use this annular milling technique. We, we mill in this annular pattern, where in the middle, the central part, we, there's no ion impingement there. And so we start to mill away the material, and over time, we will decrease the diameter, that inner, the inner diameter there. And over time, you'll create this needle. You'll get sharper and sharper. And so we end up with an end form, a needle shaped end form morphology with a tip diameter on the order of less than 100 nanometers there. And when we apply uh, kilovolt ranges, that's how we can get uh, tens of volts per nanometer fields with that very small tip. Okay. And because of the, this diameter and the shape of this tip, there's actually a great opportunity to then apply other techniques on the same volume, right? So if we do our lift outs and attachment and, and making these needles instead of on these arrays, but if we do these on these TEM half grids, then that same volume can then be taken into a TEM and, and, and studied there before we do apply APT, which is a destructive technique, right? So that gives you the opportunity to do correlative one-on-one -on -one analysis of the same exact volume, right? And so here, this is just a quick example. I'm not going to go into any, any, of, the, in, any of the details, but you can correlate the, the structure and, and composition you can get with STEM or TEM analysis, STEM analysis with the APT analysis, right? And it can be quite powerful. So it's a great opportunity with the same volume there. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears here. So now we've explained the technique and how the samples are made. I'm gonna talk about the heart of the talk here. You know, go into the heart of the talk here. 
And so the motivation I had here was to try to develop APT to study hydrated materials and really towards biology. So it's shown on the left here, it's just an example, right? We have a, a corroding material down at the bottom there. Um, and, excuse me, corroding material down at the bottom and it's in a liquid solution, it's in a corroding solution there. And we may be interested in what's happening right at that interface between the liquid and solid, right? And that's really important for many different systems, you know, corrosion, obviously, um, electrochemical systems, what's happening through electrocatalysis, uh, electro deposition of materials, what's really happening there. Um, in biology, of course, that's a very important interface, right? That's where a lot of the action takes place, you know, at the surface of, of, of um, surfaces, solid surfaces. I'm going to insert your application wherever. However, being able to study this a priori, a liquid solid interface and atom probe tomography is challenging because one thing that I had on the slides, I apologize, but I didn't explicitly say is that the technique is an actual UHV, ultra high vacuum technique. So we cannot just put liquids into them, right? It's incompatible. So you've got to freeze your samples, right? This requires solidification of that, of that system to look at the liquid solid interfaces, right? Or these hydrated materials. And so with that in mind, then that really requires then new hardware development, right? Okay, so um, I had mentioned here, um, I'm really motivated uh, more so instead of material science side on the biology side, trying to develop APT for biology. Okay, and as we step into this journey of trying to figure out how to apply APT to frozen materials, we started out with some, some very preliminary experiments, um, which I'll get into in a moment. But what can we start to learn, right, in biological systems if we can apply ABT to them, right? So I'd like to draw your attention to this schematic from, from, the, from this um, journal article shown uh, reference there at the bottom. And this is just a schematic of the inside of a cell, right? You have the cell membrane, you have extracellular material outside and intracellular material inside with the cytoplasm and you've got these organelles and, and whatnot. And you have macromolecules floating around and gradients that exist between pools of different regions, right? And so chemical gradients exist in these cellular and biological systems, right? And these gradients span uh, micro scale to nanometer scales. And really those gradients drive a lot of the function of biology, right? However, there really doesn't exist good techniques that can measure quantitatively what are those gradients? What is the scale? What is the, the, the magnitude of those gradients? And what is the spatial distribution of those gradients, right? If, if we were able to freeze that, those, those biological systems, the, 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 the liquid systems there, and then analyze with that probe, we might be able to say something about that, right? And so that's what maybe APT can, can deliver, right? We might be able to, to start to measure ionic and macromolecular molecular gradients in biological systems. In addition, we have the potential, since we're measuring the 3D composition, maybe we can even start to measure macromolecular structure. Maybe even, a, you know, a holy grail would be protein structure, right? Determining protein structure from this. And I'm gonna go into more of that detail towards the end here. Um, so one of the first experiments um, in this journey was um, to set up an experiment to, to show that we can even say something important about a biological system at all. Right? And this was even before we were thinking about going cryo at the moment. So we decided to look at, uh, to analyze this uh, ferritin protein molecule, but not in cryogenic at the time, but in, 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 a, in a resin embedded system that we can apply room temperature preparation techniques in the FIB. So we took this ferritin molecule and we embedded it in this, in this resin. And we chose ferritin for a very specific reason. It has a, it's a bio mineral composite. It has a central iron ferrihydrite mineral core. It's basically a hydrated iron oxide core, which is about eight nanometer diameter, surrounded by a protein shell. The idea is that we would embed this in a, in a resin. Um, they would be home, you know, homogeneously distributed and we would do a lift out of that, right? Oops, apologize here. So the, the, this core contains iron. Iron is important because it adds as, acts as a fiducial marker, a chemical marker for us to to give us confidence that we're actually measuring the protein. And then we chose low acryl, this resins, because it doesn't, it was only, it's a polymethyl methacrylate based uh, resin. It does not contain any nitrogen. It only contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Whereas the 
protein shell itself contains those same elements plus nitrogen. So we have the potential to use nitrogen as a, also a fiducial marker, right? Chemical fiducial marker to distinguish the protein. So we prepared the specimens using an FIB to do a lift out, right? After we fix them, and shown here at the bottom right is a tip of this resin, and inside shown schematically as we should have this ferritin distributed throughout, right? And so here, I'm just gonna go into the results of that first experiment, right? Here's the distribution of just the iron. I'm leaving out all the organics that we measured there. We're just looking at the iron, which should distinguish the cores of these ferritin, right? And you can see that there's heterogeneous distribution, right? We've got these clusters of, the, of these iron, which is indicative of measuring the cores of them. And if we zoom in on one of them, you can see it here in different directions. And you can see that even within the core, we can see clustering there. So heterogeneous distribution of iron in the core. Looks like several little uh, nanoparticles of, 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 of um, iron ferrihydrate that are coming together in this way. And because we have the distribution of the atoms in three dimension, then we can say something about the composition relative to those cores. And what's shown here in the central part in this plot is a radial composition profile that goes, that follows the contours of not just one, but many, tens of these averaged over these, um, these cores. And so down at the bottom, the zero position represents the surface of one of these cores. To the left in the negative direction is the composition inside the core. To the right is outside of the core or into the protein and eventually into the resin. So we can see inside the core, it's rich in iron, which is we expect. And then the composition starts to drop down as we go outside. And we see the iron phosphates come up, interestingly right at outside. So this is indicative of phosphates, iron phosphates being at the surface and not in the central part of the core. Then we have the detection of free iron, or free phosphorus, I apologize. The distribution of that comes up after the iron phosphate. So it looks like there's free phosphorus that is outside of the, of the core. Interestingly, we found sodium, right, to be at the surface there. So we have this core shell shell structure. We have the iron core, iron phosphates, and then sodium there, which is interesting, an interesting result there. And so this result, what we ended up finding was we were, this is one of the first or the only technique to directly measure the composition of the iron phosphate and prove that the iron phosphate was there. So we actually were able to say something important about this biological system, right? But from a development standpoint, this gave us this gave us confidence that we can say something important or intelligent about the biological system, right? However, we were unable to really distinguish the protein shell, even though nitrogen was rich in it, from really the, 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 the organic resin, right? It became really challenging to determine where's that interface and, and determine any structure from them because everything is organic, right? All we have is compositions, the elements. And so we would be much better we would be able to do this much better if we replace that with water, right? Replace the resin with the water. And that's what we're doing here. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. So, but that requires to do this whole same analysis now in a frozen state. We can't just put that into the atom probe, right? We have to now develop hardware in protocol development to actually perform experiments in ABT in the cryogenic conditions. And so this part of the journey was, was took several years of developing hardware, right? How do we actually figure out to make samples cryogenically and then transfer them protected from say a cryo FIB where we're gonna make them into the ABT and keep them protected throughout the, throughout the transfer process. And so we're gonna, this approach is twofold. Okay, we developed hardware that would attached to the atom probe that would allow us to then provide us a means to attach a what's called an environmental shuttle device, a device that will then allow the sample to be docked into um, onto the atom probe and transfer a specimen. And that same shuttle can then dock onto a cryofib where the sample is prepared. So the shuttle device acts as the shuttle, if you will, right, to go between the fib, cryofib, and the cryo ABT. And I'll describe that in much more detail here. And so what we designed on the atom probe is what we call the environmental transfer hub, the ETH. And this is what it's shown uh, this, um, here in, in a CAD drawing attached there. 
and really its function for the for our purposes of the cryo APT, it allows us to transfer specimens under controlled environments, right? Under protected environments. Um, it's really made up of three three parts here. We have the main chamber, which connects the the leap, the atom probe, local electro atom probe to this structure here, to, to this chamber system. Um, we have a load lock here, cryo transfer adapter load lock that allows us to dock a um, the transfer shuttle device. And then we also, it's modular, the system's modular, so we can even attach other ancillary equipment, which I'm not gonna talk about in this talk, but say, such as a catalyst reactor system that we can then attach for in-situ reactions for APT, but that's the beyond the scope of this talk here. This is actually what the system looks like on, on our current atom probe in my laboratory right now. Um, you can see here attached to the atom probe, and there's a long transfer rod here, which takes our samples once they're loaded in, into here, allows us to go under UHV conditions and transfer into the atom probe. Um, the shuttle device docks to this load lock as shown here um, in the picture. Schematically on the left, you can see cutaway. The shuttle device has a transfer arm that allows us, once it's under vacuum, to transfer the, the, the frozen sample into the, the UHV system or this uh, environmental transfer hub. And there, there's a cryo-cooled carousel puck which allows us to store the samples um, under a controlled uh, temperature and a controlled pressure environment and getting them ready to be transferred into the atom probe for analysis. And this is, a, on the right here, is a zoomed in picture. Um, importantly, the shuttle device, uh, it handles our atom probe pucks and you can see that shown here, right? We modified one of these systems to do that. And so on the FIB state, on the FIB part, um, we're working, we had to modify the FIB to be compatible with APT type specimens. And here we worked with initially with one of these uh, commercially available quorum systems. So, so it's commercially available cryo FIB attachment. You can attach it to your FIB and turn it, your FIB into a cryo FIB system. Um, and that's what's shown here and the shuttle device. So we modified the shuttle device to handle the atom probe pucks. We also had to make modifications to the inside of the FIB, right? We had to modify the, the cold stage so that it can accept the atom probe pucks. So we made an adapter that then bolts onto the quorum cryo stage so that we can insert and, and manipulate atom probe pucks where we're gonna do the lift outs and sample creation. And if you're gonna do a lift out, cryo lift out, um, your, your probe that you're gonna, your nano manipulator probe that you're gonna be lifting out also has to be cold, otherwise, you'll start to defrost your sample if your probe is warm, right? And you're picking up something that's cold. So we developed a, a few iterations of this for a custom cryo Omni probe with an integrated thermal couple inside so that we can do the lift outs and keep everything cold. Yeah, uh, everything cold. Now we were also, um, we also developed a, a very specialized um, uh, specimen clip system where we have our micro post arrays for our lift outs. But then on that same specimen, right, on the same uh, array uh, holder here, we also are able to put our frozen specimens. So we can do a lift out from, say, a frozen TEM grid of biological material and directly transfer it to the same, to the region adjacent to it and prepare our samples there. And, and then we can, this whole structure can then go into the atom probe and we'll do the analysis. So it removes the, the, the need to, to insert and, 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 and remove um, your sample during a lift out and then to insert different pucks. So you can do everything in a one-stop shop here on this little platform. Um, and so protocol development. So, so as I mentioned, you know, a FIB is used to prepare samples and under room temperature conditions. This is done routinely. We, uh, this is done routinely. However, at cryogenic temperatures, this approach um, has to be modified, right? Under room temperature, when you want to do a site-specific attachment or weld, weld if you quote, quote unquote, you, you can do that very specifically by introducing this, this you know, a very common precursor, this uh, platinum containing organometallic. And you can decompose that organometallic very locally um, wherever you expose the ion or electron beam. So secondary electrons, wherever they're emitted, there will deposit the material. So this is at room temperature. However, at, at cryogenic temperatures, this approach is much, much more challenging. So say we want to 
under cryogenic temperatures, say minus 190 degrees Celsius in our specimen temperature. We want to attach, make an attachment there, our weld, like we would at room temperature shown on the left. However, because of these cryogenic temperatures, when you introduce this organometallic, it will deposit uncontrollably everywhere. It condenses everywhere uncontrollably. All cold surfaces will will um, uh, will, will will accept or will be deposited with this with this material. So you get this uncontrolled overcoating, right? So most this mostly happens at most of these gas injection system gases. They all deposit uncontrollably. However, you can use this to your advantage, right? For still doing attachments, and we're not the first ones to do this. Uh, a lot of the pioneering work was centered around cryo liftouts for TEM um, specimen prep. And, and you can, there's a lot of literature that shows this where you can overcoat, uncontrolled overcoating can be used to, to make attachments, right? And welding. And shown here, this is water ice deposition instead of this organometallic. So you can use this uncontrolled yeah. deposition here for your advantage. Um, and I'm gonna talk here now about um, developing this lift out for APT, which is a different approach than TEM sample prep. It's, I, I would say it's a little more challenging actually, but it's less forgiving um, for, for, for the requirements of creating specimens cryogenically for APT. And so during this journey, at this point in time, as we were developing this, a project came across, I, I became involved in a project um, where we wanted to use cryo APT to study a hydrated material. And it gave us an opportunity to develop this cryo lift out and cryo APT analysis. And it was not in a biological system, rather it was in a material science based system. So um, I shifted gears a little bit at this time from biology, shifted over to material science and specifically looking at, uh, at, at uh, corrosion in a solid borosilicate glass used, which would be eventually used to sequester nuclear waste. So we're interested in looking at the, studying the corrosion of this glass in a water environment. Okay. And when this glass material, this glassy material, which is made up of 20, you know, well over 25 different elements, um, when it becomes con in contact with water will corrode over time. Small, uh, it's a very slow process, but it forms this, these hydrated gel-like structures. And, and, and uh, what is of interest is what is the composition and structure of these gel layers. However, getting at these structures is very challenging because if you do it at room temperature, you have to desiccate them and the structure changes, right? Once you remove the water, the water um, will then, the, the gel structure will collapse in on itself and any measurements are then um, altered. And so we're really interested in trying to look at what is this hydrated gel layer? What is that composition? So this material then became the focus of developing APT sample preparation for cryogenic specimens. Okay, so that's the motivation there. And then we're gonna apply this ultimately to biology. So shown here are glass particles embedded in water ice, okay, frozen here on one of these substrates. You can see them protruding out partially. And if you do a Cross section, you can actually see the the frozen water, and you can see the the, all, the glass, and then it's surrounding the surface is our region of interest, which is the altered or corroded glass. So how are we going to make this attachment right to this to this material? So we, we came up with several kind of tricks, quote unquote tricks, or or, or approaches to doing this for APT specimen preparation. One of the first tricks is using what are called these nano these these little nano cuts or these little fib cut lines. So under traditional room temperature lift out, if you wanted to lift out a, a material, you would take your probe and you would bring it in contact with your material of interest and you would deposit platinum in this region here, right? But I mentioned under cryogenic conditions, it can deposit everywhere and really burying your sample and region of interest under a lot of this uncontrolled platinum. So to get around that, we can do a lift out by instead, we can just use the FIB to cut these little lines, right, that overlap the probe here. And through redeposition, through this phenomenon of redeposition, you'll get an attachment, albeit a weak attachment, not very structurally robust, but a good enough to do the actual lift out. And so that's what's shown on the left here. We have the material lifted out onto the probe with these little nano cuts. Then we want to attach it 
to these microposts arrays under cryogenic conditions. And again, we're going to use those little nano cuts. So here is a micropost array here. And um, we're going to attach a portion of that using those nano cuts. And you can see here on the, on the left is after the attachment and, and, and the attachment of the subvolume, um, you can see these little line cuts there by the cursor that show those little nano cuts. Now, this attachment is not mechanically robust, so we have to strengthen it. And that's where we're going to use this overcoating, potential overcoating, right? This uncontrolled overcoating. So what we do is we cut out these notches, right? These little notch cuts where the platinum can then fill inside, right? And then we're going to introduce this platinum and it's going to go everywhere, right? But then we're going to use the fill, the, the fib to then remove, remove much of this material, right? That's what's shown here on the bottom. Schematically, we're going to attach attach it with these little cuts and we're going to apply this platinum in this wedge to fill this wedge. And once we sharpen the, the, the structure, we end up with something like this shown on the, on the right. We have our specimen, region of interest, cryogenically frozen at the tip here. We can see the notch cut with the platinum in there that provides us mechanical welding here. And you can even see the, some of the lines for those little nano fib cuts, those little line cuts there. So now we have a way right, to, to attach and to sharpen it with, and apply some of mechanical robustness to the specimen so that in, as a requirement for ABT analysis. Okay, so this is a different approach than you would take for cryo FIB or cryo FIB preparation of TEM specimens. And so just as an example, here's that, that, that material that we, that, we, um, that we analyzed, right? This is the glass. So shown at the bottom here is the interface between this hydrated gel region and this relatively unaltered uh, glass region. We can see the water in blue. We can see the segregation. So there's water in this gel-like region and much less over here. And so we're looking at an interface uh, that's shown, shown schematically. And we'll get into the details of that. But because we have the 3D distribution for this, again, you can measure the composition profiles across these interfaces and get um, uh, distributions and diffusion. You can back out diffusion coefficients here, which is really important if you're trying to develop uh, diffusion-based models. Um, also, because we have the 3D structure, we can actually uniquely start to measure what this gel looks like. And the gel is really nanoporous, nano right? We have these nanoscale pores filled with water, right? And we can actually measure that structure. And so looking here, this is a 3D volume in this porous structure where the blue is the water and the gray is the, the hydrated silicate, right? And this is the first time that anyone's ever actually been able to measure at this scale, with this level of detail, the structure of, the, of, such, a, of such a material. So only through cryo-APT can we get at this structure here, right? And really importantly, we can then start to uh, use this information that we're getting here to then feed, uh, feed into um, uh, modeling simulations like molecular dynamic simulations to help us understand the phenomenon of corrosion, right? Understand this phenomenon of corrosion. So as I mentioned then, just stepping back a moment here, um, this, this project here provided us an opportunity um, to develop these, this cryo lift out preparation approach um, of, a cryo, uh, of a hydrated material. In this case, it was a hydrated glass solid material. We were able to say something very important about this type of system. We get the structure and composition as no other technique previously has ever been able to do. And now that we have this, this approach in, in mind, we want to come back to biology. Now can we then apply this to soft biological materials that are hydrated or in their native aqueous environment, right? And so coming back here, right? So what if APT can be applied here? And I already explained about wanting to measure chemical gradients and also alluded to maybe we can even measure uh, macromolecular structure. So in, in proteins like, like this, like the ferritin molecule. So we're gonna come back to, to proteins again. But for this first set of experiments that we did, um, we, we stepped away from ferritin at the moment in the development of cryo-APT applied to uh, soft biological materials. And instead we're focusing on this catalase crystal, on these catalase 3D protein crystals. So in our laboratory, um, we took catalase protein, which are shown um, here 
in, in this 3D rendering drawing of, a, of, a, of catalase protein. And they form these tetramers. Four proteins come together to form a tetramer. And you can crystallize these into large macroscale, microscale crystals of repeating units of these tetramers. And that's what's shown here in the middle, right? We have a 3D crystal of proteins, right? Which are then rather large um, macro scale. So we can then, if we were to freeze the sample, we can actually target, site-specific target, one of these crystals for APT analysis. So that's kind of the, the, the gist, our, our, our premise, our approach to, to, to the analysis of uh, a sample like this. And shown here on the right, uh, I'll step you through, walk you through in the next slide here of how we do this. But yeah, here's here's the protein crystals embedded in water ice, in which was water ice then. Okay, so how are we going to prepare samples of protein crystals for APT analysis? So we're going to take the same approach that we applied, that we developed for the gla the corroded glass, but we're going to apply it here. Um, however, we're going to very specifically. We're gonna, we, we developed a very specific specimen geometry for this. And we're using TEM grids that we could then cryogenically freeze using high pressure freezing techniques or plunge freezing techniques to, to create vitreous ice. Um, but we, we chose these very specific TEM grids that have a, had a very specific geometry, okay? Um, and this will be described very shortly in the preparation in the manuscript that we're preparing um, here at the moment, but this geometry is such, is such that the grids have this step ledge of, uh, in the copper grid material itself that has a step ledge of about uh, uh, 10 microns here in depth before you have this holy carbon material. So the idea is that you deposit uh, biolog your, your biological sample in water on, on the backside here, and this, as you wick, as you, as this material gets wicked away, the water gets wicked away, the biological material will then get drawn into this, this microscale volume here, right? So then we're gonna target this volume here and lift it out. The reason being is that we can, when we lift it out, we have this solid copper structure with this water ice on top, right? Water ice is relatively soft in the FID, where this copper is pretty dense, right? And so that's what we're gonna do, we're gonna cut this, volume out here and then we're going to attach it with the copper to these silicon microposts in the same way I described with the glass and then we're going to sharpen it. The idea is that we'll have the water ice with the biological material at the surface there. So shown here on the bottom left is a schematic or is a SEM image of what's shown schematically above it. Right here's a cross section, here's the copper grid, here's that volume of material. If you zoom in you can see those protein crystals right there in the water ice. Okay, we're gonna lift out that volume of material as shown here. And we're gonna make our attachments to these microposts. And if we look in cross-section on the attachment, you can then again see the silicon microposts. There's our copper with our little nano welds, our notch cut with the platinum attached there in the same way that we showed with the glass. And then very importantly, we have our water ice above it, right? This is done cryogenically. In this, in this case, our cryo stage is at about minus 185 degrees Celsius during this whole process. Then we're gonna annular mill it into a needle, right? And that's what's shown here. So we have the catalyzed protein crystals in water. You can start to see the dark contrast of those crystals there, right at the tip and in through the volume. Then we can use our cryo shuttle, go from the cryo fib into our atom probe, and then perform the analysis. So very, very, uh, very new results here. Uh, so here's the catalyst protein, our sample, one of the samples we analyzed. Here's the mass spectra that we're getting here, right? Um, I'll, I'll dive into it a little deeper here. So it's relatively clean mass spectra. And I say relatively clean because it becomes more obvious how clean it is if you were to repeat the same experiment, but instead of water ice, we had that catalyst protein crystals embedded in resin, in, as is the case when I talked about the ferritin. This same catalyst protein crystals um, are shown here in the resin. So you can see by comparison, the mass spectra, the difference, how much more complicated the mass spectra for the resin is because the resin is made of organics and the fragmentation of those organics leads to a much more complicated um, uh, mass spectra, right? And if we zoom in where we expect a lot of the, the 
the organics from proteins to exist at less than 50, 60 Daltons in an APT analysis, you can see that by comparison, how much simpler the mass spectra is for water ice, which is shown up here at the top, versus the catalase protein in resin, right? So it's very, it seems, one, one result we're finding is very advantageous actually, to study these complicated biological systems in water ice because the mass spectra and the chemical identity in which we're gonna apply is much more simple, much simpler in the case of water ice. Right, so there's an advantage, advantage there. So if we focus on the water ice sample then, right, we start to identify the peaks here. Um, we can identify uh, organics. So we can do the carboxyl groups and amine groups, carboxylic acid groups, uh, uh, part of the protein. And importantly, there's the water, right? And water comes off, we can see different forms of the water, clustering of the water there. Um, very importantly though, I highlight the, the, the CO groups and the CH and CH2N groups, right? And if we look at closely with these protein, the backbones of any protein, they're actually made up of these alternating sequences of CO groups, carboxyl groups, and the amine groups. They alternate CO, CNH2, CO, CNH2, and that's the backbone of a protein, right? And it just repeats over and over. And we're actually measuring that in the composition here. So it gives us some confidence that we're actually measuring the composition of the protein, right? However, if we start to look at the 3D distribution, this is where um, we're at now. Um, we're able to start to, if you map out the CO group and the CNH2 groups, their distributions, you can see that they're heterogeneous, right? They're not homogeneous. So there's regions here of high CO content and high CNH2 content. So we're starting to see segregation. However, it's really challenging at this point to really extract out structure, to say anything intelligent about the structure. Because if you think about it, all atom probe tomography is giving you is the 3D positions of the atoms, right? It gives you no information about how those atoms were bonded. Or if we're measuring, if we're detecting small clusters of ions, say like CO groups, we have no idea of the orientation of that ion from the surface. We have no orientation. We just know a 3D position in space. Right? So really to say anything about the structure, you need computational tools right, to do that. And so that's where we're going next, machine learning. We're applying machine learning models, developing models that can go in and mine the structure and determine through nearest neighbor relationships, what is the most probable uh, 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 bonding structure to, to then extract out the actual composite or the, the, the actual structure of these uh, macromolecules or proteins. So that's really exciting prospect for us, where we're going with this, right? So we can, we show that going cryogenically for these atom probe, uh, cryogenically for atom probe analysis of soft biological hydrating materials is advantageous. We get much cleaner mass spectra. We can uh, reduce the, 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 the convolution of different peaks that would come from otherwise resin. Um, and we're also starting to see heterogeneous distribution of these organics, which is indicative of the, the ultrastructure of these macromolecules. And now we're using, trying to develop machine learning approaches then to extract out the structure, right? So then we can measure composition distributions, uh, gradients, as well as structure. So I'm gonna end here um, in my talk here. Uh, and here, just by a, a quick summary, um, we developed the, you know, talking through this, uh, developed the hardware protocols that allow us to do this analysis, uh, reported the direct first mapping of a water, water solid interface. Um, and this was in the glass material. Using that protocol development, we're then now able to develop an approach to making APT specimens cryogenically from biological materials. And we're finding that machine learning is gonna be a very important tool in the future uh, to be applied to, to this type of, uh, to, to extract structure from APT data. And so as an outlook for biology, we think you know, quantitatively, um, it's gonna be really important to, uh, to be able to measure quantitatively ionic uh, and macromolecular distributions or gradients across uh, maybe even membranes or internal to cells, as well as the potential to directly map the structure. Right? and, and, and complement other techniques that are measuring protein structure, say cryo-EM techniques, 
material science. It opens up near atomic scale composition mapping of water solid interfaces, which are important for energy and environmental materials, such as lithium ion battery materials, right? Corrosion metal alloys, uh, electrocatalysis, trying to understand what's happening at those surfaces. Uh, and um, being able to provide this chemical composition mapping and cryo really is complementary, not in competition, but complementary to other techniques. Cryo EM, cryo X-ray uh, uh, computed tomography, cryo SIMS or, or magnetic resonance imaging techniques. And so with that, I'll end by just giving a very a strong uh, acknowledgement to the scientific and technical development uh, contributions of Dr. James Evans and Dr. Ben Schreiber at PNNL, um, both of which were, were important for all the work I described here and my funding there. And with that, I will end my talk by opening it up for some questions and comments um, here. Danny, while you review those questions, I just want to remind people to thank them for participating in your e-talk and thank you for presenting the material. Uh, for those of you who have questions, please feel free to type them in. We have uh, hand, a number of minutes to go through those. Um, Danny will answer to the best of his ability the questions asked. Thank you. Right. And so I will begin. I have here a list of, of, of questions that were provided during the, um, during the registration. And there's just a handful of, of them. Several of these uh, questions were, I believe, were answered throughout the talk. But if they were, if you still have further questions, I encourage those who contributed questions initially uh, to go ahead and continue to answer those or ask those in the Q&A type in section. But um, a question was asked, um, as compared to EM microscopy, is the sample preparation more complex? I think I went over that. I think it is more complex. Um, there's, I think a little more, it, it's less forgiving. Atom probe tomography analysis is less forgiving to the deposition of these uncontrolled deposition of these materials. You really have to remove uh, a lot of that material that gets controlled or deposited uncontrollably. So I think it's a little more complex and you may have got a flavor of that uh, in what I explained. Um, another question here is, is, um, is there a cryo-APT study that has already provided a key solution to a biological or pharma question? Antibiotics, for instance. Um, Cryo-APT is really relatively new. Um, there's a few other groups along with myself who are developing this. There isn't a whole lot of results out there yet. Um, more of the, the contributions of APT to biological materials, I think, have become out of room temperature sample prep. So this is in biominerals. A lot of the key work came in out of Northwestern University um, there, uh, out, of the, out of the Yoster group there. Uh, really set uh, the foundation for APT of, uh, of biological materials. But cryo-APT, I think we're still waiting to see what's going to come out of there. So I don't think really any key solutions or any questions, any, we haven't been able to solve any scientific questions yet. But I think we've laid the foundation to do so. And I think the potential is great for that. So in the next, you know, year, a couple of years, we might be able to, to say, to answer that question a little more um, specifically. Um, another question, how do you manage localized deposition? Um, I think I answered in a cryo lift out. Um, I explained that uh, we can't control localized deposition, but we use it to our advantage uh, by adding uh, this uncontrolled platinum deposition, um, platinum molecule deposition to these little notches, right? And then, but then we ultimately have to still remove it in the FIB. Um, another question was any modeling work? Uh, the only modeling work that I'm, that I'm, currently involved in is um, is with uh, machine learning, really, application to extract out uh, structure. Um, we're currently working on a paper now as we speak, and we'll hopefully get that out, uh, out for review in the next month or so. Um, is there any example of using this technique to, for characterization related to semiconductor processing? From the cryo standpoint, um, I'm unaware of that for cryo APT. We have internally to EMSL, uh, working with scientists, others have come to me and we're, I'm helping with, we're seeing the, the application of, of, of our, of our um, uh, cryo development being applied a lot to cryo EM, cryo electron microscopy, cryo. So using uh, cryo FIB to 
um, thin samples under cryogenic temperatures, right, to minimize damage. So we're looking at electrochemical systems or mineral systems, hydrated mineral systems. So none of the work hasn't been published yet, but we're currently working on several of those. But specifically related to semiconductors, no, there has not been. Um, um, I described how the cryotransfer is performed in the APT. That was described in the talk. Um, uh, another question is high application to viewing hydrated interlayers. Um, I think, yeah, the potential is there. Um, it would be a same approach, similar approach to, to what I had just described here. Um, and being able to, to look at the composition, you know, ionic distributions in these hydrated inner layers. I don't see why you couldn't be able to uh, apply the same techniques. Um, and just a couple more questions. If I can get it, would I use the, so the VCTM so from Kamika. So the system I have used for the cryo development is based on the quorum uh, cryo vacuum, uh, cryo fib uh, preparation system. Um, there's other solutions on the market. Uh, Thermo Fisher offers a, a system also, um, as well as Kamika, who makes, who manufactures the Atom Probe. And there's different types of shuttles. I didn't get into, into some of the details of that. Our shuttle device um, is passive in both the cooling and vacuum, right? So it's not active cooling or active vacuum and really relies on a quick transfer of specimens. So for us, it's critical that the cryofib is literally next door laboratory to the atom probe so we can make transfers in less than one minute to go from the vacuum environment of a cryofib to the vacuum environment of a cryoatom probe to minimize uh, warming of the sample and whatnot. There are other systems out there that have cryo cooling or active cooling as well as active cooling and active pumping. Um, we found that we don't get a lot of frost buildup if we do the vacuum uh, transfer very quickly. And if we follow a very specific sequence of steps to do the transfer. Um, but if I could get this other system, I, I probably would just because I think it would probably be more robust and having active cooling and active pumping to me seems like a, a good idea, um, you know, to minimize uh, contamination. Um, and, and there was another question, a background understanding of the technology. Um, so I hope I provided some information about that in the talk, but if there's whoever asked this question um, wants further, further uh, clarification, please reach out to me. So now I'm gonna look at the Q&A questions that were typed out here, and I'm just gonna go in order here. Um, so for, for uh, Timothy Spila asked, um, I show FEPO2 on slide 19. Is there something, is that something that comes off as a cluster or something that you can put together after the fact? That specifically, um, that specific ion um, is, uh, we measured directly. So it was a cluster of an iron, one iron, one iron atom, one iron, phosphorus atom, two oxygen atoms. The mass that we measured in the detect in, in the mass spectra was consistent with that specific molecule. We also measured FEPO3 and FEPO, um, but FEPO2 happened to be the largest, strongest signal, which we which we used to to uh, to to um, report there. But that's we measured these as as a cluster, which led us to conclude that these are coming out as iron phosphates, right? Next question. Um, I'm sorry for not pointing to this specific slide, but let me see here. On slide 30, is there any current or voltage restriction of the ion beam for cryo attaching and cutting? Yes, there is. Um, we describe some of the, the, the specifics in the, man, in the manuscript that I have referenced here at the bottom in ultra microscopy a couple of years ago by, by Schreiber and myself. Um, but yes, the water and things like that, you need to end up using relatively low uh, currents um, and, and uh, accelerating voltages, um, you know, 
15 kilovolts or less, eight kilovolts under certain cases, and um, um, low, low currents, less than one nanoamp, or less than one, yeah, much less than one nanoamp of, of, of currents for the cutting and the catching. But again, uh, there's some more specifics described in the paper there. Um, let's see, uh, next talk, or next question, hi, sorry. Can you comment on how you form the solid ice samples from the initial solid liquid sample? How you ensure the sample is this, the coldest spot so that the water does not absorb on other parts of the cold finger while cooling down the cryogenic temperatures. So the, the preparation of our samples uh, for cryoanalysis is all done ex situ of the FIB. Okay, so we'll take samples and in most cases we prepare most all of our cryogenic specimens on TEM grids. So we're looking at particles, uh, if in the case of the, the, the glass, or we're looking at uh, biological materials like protein crystals. And so we can use established cryogenic specimen preparation techniques that have been established in the, in the TEM community there. So we're using fast cooling techniques, so high pressure freezing, or using these robots, these vitro bots that can then plunge freeze a sample into say liquid ethane. Um, and, and on these TM grids, we have very relatively small volumes to help our chances of reaching vitrification. But vitrification isn't always, uh, isn't always achieved, um, but, but all the specimen preparation is done ex situ. And so, when we then transfer it into the fib, it's already frozen. And then we can then site specific target any region of interest. And the sample is kept cold under cryogenic temperatures in the cold, in the cryo fib environment under, under uh, high vacuum conditions. Um, to control the absorption or, or sublimation of that, of the environment there, we can actually control the temperature and the pressure of the, of the FIB. To minimize that, but in my case, in my examples that I've shown here, um, we don't actually ever see that to be a problem. I don't ever see deposition of water ice on the specimen's region of interest, nor do we experience sublimation. Um, let's see here, another another question here. How are we doing the time? Maybe go for a few more minutes here. We're doing uh, fine on time, Danny. Okay, thank you. Um, how do you know what processing doesn't alter, how do you know that the processing doesn't alter your sample and hide the information you seek regarding the structure and composition of the native sample? That's a very good question. That's a very good question. We, so for, for in either case, right, um, the FIB is you in, in, in both the, the material science related application with the glass and in the biological application with the 3D crystals, we're using an FIB. An FIB is known to create and alter the structure, right? Through damage, right? We're, we're hitting the sample with high energy ions, right? In the material. Um, but one way that um, has been shown, at least in room temperature preparation, um, and that it's been shown many, many times is that um, the damage is localized to, can be localized when you're preparing the samples if you use low KV, low accelerating voltages and currents to the very surface. And um, you can monitor that by the distribution of the implanted gallium ions from the FIB, the FIB if you're using a gallium FIB, right? In that case. And that, having the gallium and the ions is advantageous there because then you can track in 3D with the atom probe where those distribution of ions are, right? And if they're at the very surface there, then your analysis obviously would then be performed below that structure, right? You would somewhat ignore or throw out that data up there because you know that you've altered that structure there. Um, but ultimately, how do we know if we're, any of the other processing through the transfer in the, like that is altering the structure? At this moment, we do not know. So we would need other techniques to kind of validate this. And this would be something like cryo TEM, right? Where we can take a specimen prepared in a cryo fib using protected environmental 
uh, approaches transferred into the cryo TEM. We can perform some analyses there. It, it maybe even perform a, a structure or, or diffraction analyses to know that we still have vitrified ice or your structure is not altered. And then that will provide some confidence um, and then transfer that specimen back out and into the atom probe in similar way as I described when I described um, the, the correlation of APT and TEM in earlier slides. But that's a very good question. Um, that's always needs to be kind of addressed and talked about and, 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 um, and mitigated. If, if strategies have to be implemented to mitigate um, the possibility there. Um, another question, could you comment on the mechanical failure of ice in high fields and also the different field of and also the different field evaporation fields of ice versus organic organic material and how this complicates reconstruction. Um, we found interestingly that water ice is relatively robust. Um, and one 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 thing that I one detail that I did not mention in the technique for the cryo APT analysis of the proteins is that we're not actually even using a laser in this case. We're using just an electric field to field evaporate the sample. So there's another mode, which I won't get into, but there's another mode of atom probe analysis where you can use voltage pulsing instead of, volt, instead of laser pulsing to induce field evaporation. So we wanted to minimize any kind of effects of the laser on the specimen, uh, alter, uh, altering the specimen by giving it thermal energy. So we remove that by just using voltage pulsing. And we find that very interestingly, the samples are cryogenically frozen, the cryogenically prepared samples um, with water are relatively robust. And the mechanical failure rate is relatively low, surprisingly, under voltage pulsing. Um, we feel that I haven't been able to do any systematic studies of water ice yet to know the relative fields, but comparing in the results here, the relative fields of the water ice compared to the organics seems to be much lower, right? Much lower. Organ the organics uh, carbon in, potentially, in particular has the highest evaporation field compared to something like water. Um, how that complicates the reconstruction, that's a very open question. We're trying to deal with that now as we speak, um, as, as, as we are developing the machine learning uh, algorithm. So at the, at the moment, we're not exactly sure how it's complicating the reconstruction, but it's a very good question. So I think it's still early to, to really give a definitive answer one way or another. Okay, here's another question. Um, which we still know, okay, Heather? Yes, we're good to go. We're gonna let you go through the questions. Okay, all right, Mike, uh, here's another question is regarding ion matter interaction. Although FIB preparation is conducted at cryogenic temperatures, I wanted to know whether the ion collisions with organic matter would somehow modify heat knock-on? Yes, that's a good question. That it's related to maybe the previous question about the alteration. Absolutely, that, that kind of thing is of concern. Um, heating of the specimen is mitigated through the keeping the specimen cool, the cryogenic temperatures. And I had mentioned, um, uh, just a step back, I'd mentioned uh, other projects that are coming to me where, wanting, where they're wanting to use a cryofib to prepare their TEM samples where they're seen at room temperature, they're getting a lot of uh, morphization and, and damage. But under cryogenic temperatures, they're able to mitigate and reduce or even minim, you know, eliminate that damage. So going to cryogenic temperatures definitely decreases your chances of creating damage deep into the specimen. Um, and heating effects absolutely from the ion beam could be a concern, but again, we're at um, cryogenic temperatures, which helps to mitigate any heating there, right? Which would help. But um, knock-on, absolutely, that, that kind of uh, damage could occur. Um, I think some follow-up studies with, with uh, kind of uh, simulations that would would uh, some shrimp calculations maybe that, or, or other calculations that um, help you understand the penetration of these ions into the sample under cryogenic temperatures is needed. Um, and that's another area that absolutely would, would need to be worked on. But in terms of 
in terms of kind of a, a mitigating that in some sense, as I mentioned, we, t we tend to focus our analysis down deeper uh, past the surface, the very, very surface of the material where we would expect most of the damage to be. Okay. Um, can, and another question, can you discuss the challenges of freezing samples fast enough to prevent water crystallization and compositional segregation of dissol dissolved species? Uh, it's a very good question. So um, in, this qu in this, I was happen to be very close here on this slide. Um, as you can see in this specimen here, in this, in this slide here, the water ice that I'm pointing to, do I have a, the water ice, I don't have a pointer here, it's not popping up. The top right image there, under the, above the, the scale bar that says three microns, you can see the water ice. And you can actually see the grain structure of the water ice, because you can see the bright spots, the bright lines that are in the penetrating. What that likely is, is dissolved ions in the water ice outside of this particle that it has then uh, segregated to the grain boundaries of ice, right? So here we did not achieve vitrification. We actually have crystalline ice. So the formation of crystalline ice would absolutely alter any dissolved ion distribution that you measure there, right? And so in this case, you know, if we were interested in what is the distribution of water ice outside, we would need to come up with much better freezing solutions. And in this particular case, in this one, this was a very slow plunge freezing process done by hand. If you wanted to achieve vitrification in a sample like this, you would need to apply different approaches that freeze the sample much more quickly, right, uh, to achieve vitrification. In, in such a case, in a sample like this, high pressure freezing techniques, which are established in the EM community, would need to be followed. But a good question I think is up for debate and, 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 and needs to be, the story needs to be told is what happens in nanoscale volumes, right? What is the freezing process in say the pore structure that we measured in say here, right? When you have only a handful of water molecules, like literally you can count the number of water molecules in these nanoscale volumes. What is, at what point, you know, philosophically do you, do you form ice, right? And, and is the same uh, segregation of ions that occurs in non-vitrified samples outside of that pore volume still occur in these nanoscale volumes, right? The physics is gonna be completely different in this nanoscale volume than say a bulk sample. So that's still open for kind of debate on what happens. So um, I think there's still quite a bit that needs to be done, uh, but there's techniques out there that exist to, to help better achieve vitrification, like high pressure freezing or, or plunge freezing in methane. Okay, um, another question, how difficult is it to run these samples in Atom Probe? I mean, the success yield, how did you choose the analysis parameters to run the experiments? In addition, how do you consider the local magnification effects in these cases? Very, very good question. Um, this is very specific to the technique of Atom Probe. There's a lot of nuances for those who aren't familiar with the technique um, to to uh, uh, developing, uh, you know, parametric studies to determining the optimization of the parameters of which you analyze the voltages you apply, the the the, rep the rate of evaporation. If you were to use a laser, the laser powers. But in this case, in the vit in vitrified in a water hydrated systems, I am not using. In the biological case, I'm not using any laser. Um, success yield for the Voltage mode case with cryo-frozen specimens, water ice, the yield is relatively high. It's actually quite high. It's, it's, it's on the order of four of 80%, I would say. Uh, four out of every five specimens that we analyze, we will still evaporate from. We can collect tens of millions of ions from. With the, with the application of the, the laser, um, it, it um, can be a little more problematic for that. Um, I'm not gonna go into any details here, I guess maybe that could be specific um, uh, there, but if you look at pure water, say for example, pure water without any ions of water ice with a laser, it, it doesn't seem to absorb the laser, so there's no effect, and you end up um, just running in voltage mode. 
Um, but I don't want to digress too much from there. Uh, how do we choose the analysis condition parameters there? Um, we're just there, we're running in voltage mode. So just choosing a relatively low uh, 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 pulse uh, repetition rate of, of a few, you know, 100 kilohertz or so. And um, uh, detection rates, really slow detection rates so that we can minimize our, 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 uh, our, our chance of fracture. Uh, Danny? Yes? I'm going to, are you finished with that answer on that question? I am. There's about six more. Seven right, more. we're going to, I've screenshotted all the questions at this point, but we are going to have to end the presentation. Okay. Okay. Um, I do want to thank you very much for your time. I'm going to send you the remaining questions and I will get those off to the participants who asked those. Uh, for those panel uh, attendees that are still on, I want to thank you for your time and uh, please complete the evaluation form following this e-talk. Uh, Danny, again, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And I hope everyone had a good session with you. And hopefully we can do another one soon. Thank you very much for everyone for attending. And, and I'll try to answer these questions uh, as best I can. Okay, thank okay, you. And I'll send these to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.